Welcome back, everyone, to the deep dive. This time, we're taking a look at what happens after we die. Sound a bit spooky. It can be, but today we're focusing on the evidence presented in a book called Personal Survival by Dr. F. Homer Curtis. Ah, Dr. Curtis. Yeah, he really dives into some fascinating ideas about the possibility of life after death. Not just ghost stories, though, right? Not at all. He approached it from both a philosophical and a scientific perspective. He even developed a whole system he called Cosmic Soul Science. Cosmic Soul Science. I'm intrigued. What's that all about? Well, it's based on this idea that the universe isn't just what we can see and touch. You know, there's more to it than just this physical world. Okay, I'm listening. So Dr. Curtis believed that there are multiple realms of existence, like different layers of reality that we can't normally perceive. Like hidden dimensions or something. Sort of. And he argued that each of us has a soul, like a spiritual essence that exists beyond our bodies and continues on after death. So we're talking about more than just ghosts and hauntings here. Exactly. It's a bigger conversation about consciousness and the nature of reality itself. What makes it even more interesting is that Dr. Curtis connected these ideas to actual scientific discoveries happening around him at the time. Oh, like what? Well, he was particularly interested in the advancements in physics, especially the understanding of forces that we can't directly see or feel, but we know they're there. I see. He's using science to back up these spiritual concepts. Exactly. He saw those discoveries as evidence supporting this idea of a multi-layered spiritual universe. Makes you think about things a bit differently, doesn't it? It does. It makes you wonder if what we perceive as death might just be a transition to another level of existence. And that's precisely what Dr. Curtis argues. He presents death not as an ending, but as a kind of graduation, a stepping stone to a different realm. And he also tackles a pretty big question that has puzzled humans for ages. You mean reincarnation. Exactly. The idea that we live multiple lives. Yeah, that's always fascinated me. I'm curious, how does Dr. Curtis fit reincarnation into this cosmic soul science framework? He sees it as a crucial part of soul development. Each life, according to Dr. Curtis, is like a day at school for the soul, full of opportunities to learn and grow through all sorts of experiences. So we're always evolving and learning through these cycles of life, death, and rebirth. That's the idea. It's like every lifetime gives us another chance to grasp the bigger picture of the universe and our place in it. Okay, I'm starting to get the picture, but wait, he also mentioned something about rays, right? Oh yes, the rays. Yeah, can you explain those a bit more? What exactly are they? Think of them like channels of energy each one associated with specific qualities or attributes. Okay, so like different types of energy that influence us. Exactly. Dr. Curtis doesn't get into all the specifics of each ray type, but he suggests they play a role in shaping our personalities, talents, and even the challenges we face in life. Wow, that adds a whole new layer to this idea of reincarnation. It's not just about coming back as someone else. It's about our souls evolving through those various experiences and learning to work with these different energies, these rays. Absolutely. And Dr. Curtis believed that understanding this could help us understand ourselves and our purpose in life better. It's a fascinating concept. It really makes you think about how our choices and actions in this life might shape what we experience in the next. And Dr. Curtis strongly believed in the power of personal responsibility, not just in this life, but in the afterlife too. Hmm, that's something to consider. But let's get back to the idea of life after death for a moment. What evidence does Dr. Curtis actually provide for his claims? He was a doctor, right? Did he see anything in his medical practice that pointed to this bigger reality he was talking about? Actually, yes, he did. Dr. Curtis shares some fascinating stories from his practice where patients had physical or emotional symptoms that couldn't be explained medically. Oh, wow. So what did he think was causing them? He attributed them to the influence of spirits. So actual communication or interaction with those who have passed on, now things are getting really interesting. Can you share an example of one of these cases? Well, one case that comes to mind involved a woman who had this incredibly strong urge to end her own life. Specifically, she wanted to use a razor in her bathroom. Oh, that's awful. It is. And during their consultation, Dr. Curtis found out that her husband had committed suicide in that very same bathroom a year earlier using the same method. That's a chilling coincidence. Dr. Curtis didn't think it was a coincidence at all. Uh -huh. He theorized that the woman was unconsciously taking on the conditions that led to her husband's death. So there was a spiritual connection, some unseen influence affecting her mental and emotional state. Exactly. And the fascinating part is, once this connection was identified and addressed, 
the woman's suicidal urges completely disappear. Wow, that's incredible. It makes you wonder about the unseen forces that might be at work in our lives and how those who've passed on might still be connected to us. It's like we're getting a peek into a hidden world of spiritual connections. And that's just one story. Dr. Curtis documented many cases where he believed spirits were influencing the lives of his patients. So if Dr. Curtis is right, then death isn't just an ending. It's more like a transition to a different realm where consciousness continues and where we might even be able to interact with those who've passed on. This is heavy stuff. I think we need a moment to process all this. Yeah, no problem. Take your time. It's a lot to absorb. And this is just the beginning of our deep dive into Dr. Curtis's work. Back again. We were just discussing those fascinating cases where unseen forces or spirits seem to be affecting the lives of Dr. Curtis's patients. It's hard to forget those stories. And we were talking about how Dr. Curtis saw death as a transition to another realm. What exactly did he think that realm was like? Well, he really digs into this concept. He even explores some rather unsettling ideas about hells. Hells, plural. That does sound a bit ominous. It's definitely a bit unnerving. Dr. Curtis dedicates an entire chapter to letters supposedly written by people living in these lower realms of the afterlife. Letters from hell. That's a pretty intense concept. What kind of experiences do they describe? Not great ones, to be honest. They describe suffering, darkness, and a lot of despair. They talk about feeling trapped in places that seem to mirror their own inner turmoil, weighed down by past actions and negative emotions. Oh, it's not a literal fiery hell, but more like a state of being, a reflection of your internal state. That's how Dr. Curtis presents it. He makes it very clear that these hells aren't places of eternal punishment. They're temporary states brought on by a person's own thoughts and actions. It's almost like you're creating your own personal health through the choices you make in life and the energy you project out into the world. Exactly. He gives this very poignant example of a woman who committed infanticide. And in the afterlife, she finds herself wandering a desolate wasteland, constantly carrying the body of her dead baby. She can't find any peace or escape the crushing guilt. Wow, that's a very powerful and haunting image. It really drives home the potential consequences of our actions, not just in this life, but maybe in the next too. But it also sounds pretty bleak. Does Dr. Curtis offer any hope in these accounts? He does. He acknowledges the darkness and difficulty of these lower realms, but he also presents letters from heaven, offering a contrasting viewpoint. Letters from heaven, now that sounds a bit more uplifting. They definitely are. These letters describe realms filled with beauty, light, and purpose. The people in these realms continue to learn and grow. They even engage in meaningful work, helping those who've just arrived or are struggling in the lower realms. So even for those who have a difficult transition after death, there's still the possibility for growth and redemption. Absolutely. One letter tells the story of this man consumed by anger and regret. He was stuck in a really dismal place. But through reflecting on his life, feeling remorse and praying. He actually starts to transform his surroundings and creates a more harmonious state of being. It's a really powerful example of how we can change and evolve even after death. That's reassuring to hear. It's not about being damned for eternity. It's about continuing to learn and grow even in the afterlife. It seems like that's the core of Dr. Curtis's message. Life is a journey of evolution and death just continues that journey. He even applies this concept beyond just human existence. Wait, you mean like a heaven for animals? Not exactly a heaven, but Dr. Curtis devotes a whole chapter to the survival of animals after death. He explores the idea of animal consciousness and the possibility that they too might reincarnate. He shares stories of pets appearing to their owners after they've passed on. Some have even been photographed or physically manifested during seances. That's interesting. So many people have deep connections with their pets. It's comforting to think that bond might continue in some way after this life. What kind of evidence does he present for animal reincarnation, though? He mostly relies on anecdotal accounts where animals behave in ways that seem to go beyond their normal instincts. He suggests that through these strong bonds with humans, animals might absorb some of our mental and emotional energies, which could elevate their consciousness. So our interactions with animals might actually help them on their spiritual journey. That's what Dr. Curtis proposes. One of the most touching stories he tells is about a black dog that materializes to protect its owner from robbers and then vanishes once the danger has passed. That's amazing. It sounds like a scene from a movie. But it does raise questions about what consciousness really is and whether our connections with animals could run deeper than we realize. Dr. Curtis does caution against making animals too central to our lives, though, because he felt it might interfere with their natural development. 
He stresses the importance of respecting the complexities of those relationships and being mindful of the impact they have on both humans and animals. So it's about honoring their journey as much as our own. We've talked about hells, heavens, even animal afterlife experiences. What other interesting concepts does Dr. Curtis cover? He doesn't shy away from potentially controversial topics. He delves into the claims of theosophists, a spiritual movement that was popular during his time. Interestingly, they often discourage direct contact with the dead. Why would they discourage that? You'd think connecting with loved ones who've passed on would be a source of comfort. The theosophists argued that it could be dangerous. They felt it might expose people to negative influences or disrupt the natural progression of those in the afterlife. Dr. Curtis, however, disagreed with this view. He actually believed personal communication could be beneficial. So he was more open to talking with the deceased? Yes. He argued that while it requires careful thought and caution, communicating with those who've passed could be a valuable way to gain spiritual understanding and grow personally. He even suggests that Madame Blavatsky, who was a key figure in the theosophical movement, continued to communicate after her death, working through mediums to share her teachings. It's almost like he's saying, don't just blindly follow what any authority tells you, even spiritual authorities. Explore these ideas for yourself and come to your own conclusions. That seems to be the heart of his message. He encourages critical thinking and personal exploration. He reminds us that each person's spiritual journey is unique. That's really empowering. It's not about accepting dogma, but about finding your own truth and forging your own path. But with all this talk about hells, heavens, and spirit communication, what does Dr. Curtis say about the actual experience of dying? He describes it as a process, not an instantaneous event. He talks about a life ray that connects the soul to the body and slowly withdraws at the time of death. He even outlines different doors of exit for the soul, depending on a person's focus and development in life. Wait, different doors of exit? What do you mean? He says that people who are more spiritually evolved might exit through the top of the head, while those focused on love and compassion might exit through the heart. It's as if our focus during life influences our transition into the afterlife. Wow, that's something to think about. It makes you wonder if our thoughts, actions, and even values not only affect our lives, but also shape the way we die. Dr. Curtis certainly believed that how we live has a profound impact on our spiritual journey, both here and in the hereafter. This has been quite a journey so far. We've covered hells, heavens, animals, spirit communication, and even the dying process. It's a lot to process, but I'm finding it strangely comforting. Comforting. In what way? Well, it can be unsettling at times, but there's also this underlying sense of hope. It suggests that death isn't the end. It's more like a passage to another realm where consciousness continues and where there's the possibility for growth, forgiveness, and maybe even reuniting with loved ones we've lost. I think that's a thread that runs through all of Dr. Curtis's work. He wants to give us a glimpse beyond what we normally see to challenge our fears and offer a broader perspective on both life and death. I have to ask though, does he offer any practical advice on how to prepare for this transition? He does. Dr. Curtis emphasizes living consciously, cultivating positive thoughts and emotions, and seeking spiritual understanding. He truly believed that by focusing on our spiritual growth in this life, we can make our transition into the next one smoother. So it's not just about what happens after we die, but about how we live right now. Exactly. Dr. Curtis saw a meaningful and purposeful life as the best way to prepare for whatever lies beyond. That's a powerful thought to leave us with. But before we wrap things up, I have a question for you. With all this talk about spirit communication and the possibility of connecting with those who've passed on, if you had the chance, what would you ask a loved one on the other side? That's a really good question. I think I would ask. It's a deeply personal question, and I totally get why you might not want to share that here. But it does make you think, doesn't it? If we really could connect with those who've passed on, what would we want to ask them? What wisdom or guidance would we be looking for? It's definitely a thought-provoking question. Mm. And it brings us to one of Dr. Curtis's most interesting points. Death doesn't necessarily mean the end of our relationships with loved ones. That's a comforting idea, knowing those connections might endure in some way. But I want to circle back to the evidence Dr. Curtis presents. We've talked about spirit influence and those intriguing letters from the afterlife, but he goes even deeper, right? Oh, absolutely. He explores some truly incredible phenomena that he believes offer concrete proof of life after death. One of the most fascinating is spirit photography. Spirit photography, like those old photos where you see vague shapes or faces lurking in the background. You can't be like that. Yeah. 
But Dr. Curtis highlights some compelling cases where the images captured seem to go beyond any ordinary explanation. One example he gives is a photograph taken at the Cenotaph in London on Armistice Day. The faces of deceased soldiers appear among the crowd. So he's suggesting that these aren't just blurry images or tricks of the light. He's saying these are spirits manifesting in a way that can be captured on film. Exactly. He believed that spirits could partially materialize, creating a visible form that a camera could pick up. That's a bold statement. What other evidence does he offer? He describes slate writing, where messages seem to appear on slates as if out of thin air. Often these messages are even written in the distinct handwriting of deceased individuals. He tells stories about receiving these messages from loved ones and even historical figures like Abraham Lincoln. It's almost like they're reaching across from the other side to communicate. But couldn't this just be explained by some clever tricks or a sleight of hand? I mean, stage magicians pull off those kinds of things all the time. Dr. Curtis acknowledges that fraud is possible, especially in stage situations. However, he presents cases where the circumstances seem to rule out trickery. For example, he describes the formation of wax gauntlets, where melted wax solidifies into hand molds. The incredible part is that these molds bear the unique fingerprints of individuals who have passed away. Fingerprints? Wow, that's pretty specific. How does he explain that? He argues that spirits can, for a brief moment, materialize their hands, leaving behind physical evidence of their continued existence. The level of detail in some of these fingerprints is remarkable. They even match records taken when the individuals were alive. Okay, that's hard to dismiss as a simple magic trick. It sounds like he's presenting evidence for something beyond our normal understanding of reality. Does he also talk about the phenomena we hear about in ghost stories? You know, like objects moving on their own or strange noises? He does. He delves into a ports, which is when objects appear out of nowhere during seances, and asports, where objects vanish from one place and then show up in another, sometimes miles away. I've heard tales about those, but I always figured they were just legends or exaggerations. Does he give any specific examples? He describes a case where, during a seance attended by the famous scientist Alfred Russell Wallace, a seven-foot sunflower suddenly appeared with dirt still clinging to its roots. In another instance, a golden lily that was sitting on a table during a seance vanished seven days later. All that was left was a hole in a piece of mummy cloth that had been wrapped around its stem. There was no tear or cut in the cloth to explain how the stem had been removed. A seven-foot sunflower materializing out of thin air. A lily disappearing without a trace. That's mind-blowing. It seems like he's pushing the limits of what we think is possible. He also explores levitation, where objects or even people float in the air as if gravity doesn't apply, and poltergeists, those mischievous entities known for throwing things around, making noises, and basically causing mayhem. Poltergeists. Now we're getting into spooky territory. Didn't he mention something about John Wesley's family experiencing poltergeist activity? Yes. He talks about the Epworth phenomena. The Wesley family, John Wesley being the founder of Methodism, was tormented by unexplained noises, rapping sounds, and objects levitating in their home. This went on for weeks. While Dr. Curtis doesn't offer concrete explanations for these occurrences, he presents them as evidence of a realm beyond our normal perception, a realm where unseen forces can interact with the physical world. Wow, this is a lot to absorb. Spirit photography, slate writing, objects appearing and disappearing, levitation, poltergeists. It's like stepping into a science fiction story. But Dr. Curtis was a doctor, a man of science. How does he reconcile these seemingly supernatural events with his scientific background? That's the crucial point. Dr. Curtis didn't see these phenomena as supernatural. He saw them as part of a larger, more interconnected reality that science is just beginning to understand. He believed that our knowledge of the universe is still evolving, and that what seems impossible today might be common knowledge tomorrow. So he's not asking us to throw out reason and critical thinking. He's asking us to open our minds to a wider range of possibilities. Exactly. He encourages us to approach these mysteries with curiosity, a discerning heart, and a willingness to question our assumptions. It's a challenge, but it's also exciting to think that reality might be so much more vast and complex than we currently understand. Dr. Curtis certainly gives us a lot to think about. As we wrap up our deep dive into his work, I'm filled with a sense of wonder and a desire to keep exploring. I think it's a perfect note to end on. Dr. Curtis invites us to question, to seek, and to never stop exploring the mysteries of life and death. He reminds us that the journey of discovery is never truly over and that the search for truth is a lifelong pursuit. Well said. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the fascinating world of Dr. F. Homer Curtis.
We hope it sparked your curiosity and inspired you to continue your own exploration of these thought-provoking concepts. Until next time, keep seeking, keep questioning, and keep diving deep.